Hello you lovely lot, welcome back to Wednesday's video here at Bearham Engines. Right guys, good news. Well, it's bad news and good news actually. Bad news first. Um, the first subject I'm gonna go on about today is Cosworths. And I know some of you are getting a little bit fed up with the Cosworths, but like I said in the last video, that's what I do. So, first job of today, we've had a block in from a customer up country. Um, and this is, you can see this block has been wire wrong in the past. So we can't face the top of the block. He wants to keep it like that, but he has sent it in for six long studs. So I have just received the studs from Julian Godfrey and you can see that I've machined for the six studs. Again, like I've said in previous videos, for you that have watched, but for you that haven't watched, um, you can see that I've got the, the counter bore in the outer four of the six there for the little blue seals that go over the studs, but we don't need them in the center two because these are not through holes. They are just a blind hole. Um, they don't go into the water jacket, so no need. But that's done now, guys. All I've got to do is just blow it all out and tap them, um, or run the tap down there, make sure they're all clean, try the studs in there, and then I can pack that up, get it back to the customer. Right, buddy. It is, what day is it today? Wednesday. Wednesday. So, didn't manage to get much video done yesterday. I had to go and pick the kids up. Yeah. Early, so, and it was a busy day. So I've come in this morning, um, I had a gentleman come down from Rochdale. Really? Yeah, come all the way down. Christ. Bought us another Cosworth engine over there, mate. On the crane. We'll go into that a little bit later, the story into that. So first thing I've got to do today, um, now I've got the Cosworth long stud job done in the box. Oh yeah. This is the Honda. Been hanging around now for a week or two, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so all I've got to do is put the pistons rods crank in this. Um, just make sure all the clearances are right, the usual, mate. Uh, I said in a previous video about the difficulty getting these off because they're not circlipped. Oh, right. So there. we've got a little jig that we hold the piston to stop it from sort of crushing up. Do you have to press them off then? Had to press them off, yeah. And then, and then we do the usual heat the heat the rods up to put them back on yeah. and get them together fairly sharpish. The, the first thing I noticed is I had to bore this to um, 81.5, which is half a mil oversize yeah because they're the pistons that he's got out of the old block that went all a bit belly up yeah but these are all good aren't they yeah, yeah. these are all good um so we're going to use these again what i did was bore it to the round figure 81.5 yeah um but having measured this these pistons here it only gives us about a thou running clearance that right, so okay. that is the exact reason why we need the pistons when we bore a barrel or a block yeah you need the box they came in with all the info and everything that, you do yeah. yeah so you can't assume that the round figure is going to be the, the finished bore size and give you the right running clearance yeah so sure enough it doesn't we want to be running on these about three and a half thou so it means i've got to take another two far out of the block yep um, so obviously i've got to do that before i do the ring gaps and then um plastic gauge the bearings etc so that's next on my list mate yep but just moving back over to the Cosworth. Oh yeah. So you can see here, I've managed to get me uh, a standard set of pistons. I'll put my own pockets in, as I always do. Yeah. And when we do a dummy build, I might have to take some off the top, usual story. Now this block, mate, said in the previous video about these liners. Wet liner conversion. Wet liner conversion, it? sort of. Um, now originally, these are Nicosil, and I yeah. would have thought, although there's no markings on, I would have thought these were made by a company called Capricorn. Um, but we don't want to be using the Nicosil anymore. So I've managed to, it's all a bit top secret, this. <laughs> and we shouldn't really have them. Um, but all it does, we've had to order some, get them made, a replica of these, but in ductile iron. Um, so while they're being made, We've managed to beg, borrow and steal a set that's already been done. Bloody hell. But like I say, it's all a bit top secret. Can't tell you too much more about it at the minute. But there they are, mate. So instead they're of five, a, five like six a, weeks. Just a finished item ready to go. Finished item in ductile iron, which means we can machine them. Perfect. So these have got about 2,000 to come out anyway to, for these pistons to fit, get the right running clearance. Um, I've measured them compared to that absolutely identical, which is perfect. Yeah. So 
we're going to get these in the block, mate. All it means is we ain't got to wait five weeks for a set of liners. We can yeah. get them in and get this job done. Perfect. Um, so you can see I've already got two here. I've got the block round here. So I'll just show you the process. Now, you see we've got two in already. So oh, yeah. I've measured them and what we've got is we've got um, a thou and a half interference down the bottom. So I'm not going to heat the block up. I know a lot of people say, oh, I would heat the block or stick the liner in the freezer and all this. It's a thou and a half. It's not going to remove any material. Um, and the reason I'm not going to heat or shrink anything and just do it both at room temperature is so when they bottom out, because they do need to bottom out on this flange down the bottom, okay? Yeah. Um, you've got the interference down here. What we're going to do is put them in down the bottom with some 620, okay? So this is a, a sort of retaining glue, if you like. Yeah. Um, but it's good under heat, etc. So it's not going to affect when the block gets warm or be affected. So we put some of that around the top of the liner, not the block, um, because whatever you put on the block is going to get pushed down to the bottom yeah. and sit underneath that flange. We don't want that and give no. you a false bottom out. Um, so what I do is I put a smear of that round inside here, obviously making sure that everything's clean. Now you can see this block, we have blasted it in the vapor blaster. Yeah, it looks quite good now. Yeah, made sure it's all clean, got the rust off, etc. And the way these liners work, um, they sit with the one and a half hour interference down the bottom. Then they sit on the flange down there and the top has got also a thou and a half interference there. So that right. just pushes in. All right. So mm. what the first thing we've got to do is push the liner. So we'll put this on. We've got to push the first bit of the liner through here and make sure it's all lined up. And then we use the two bars crossed over on the top. Um, and as I say, the re as, that's why I haven't heated the block because if I heat the block and push these liners down, yeah. using the glue down the bottom, what I don't want is when it cools down, it lifts the liner up and what happens then is when you run it, um, the liners can drop and obviously you can blow the gasket. So. so you're putting that in this, on that? Uh... Yeah, I'm putting this on that diameter down yeah. below the flange there, all the way around. Don't have to go mad with it, it's just... Um, it's just literally like a sealant, really, making sure that no water can get down into the sump or vice versa, the, the oil coming up to the top. So I'll go and quickly grab a line a bit. Cool. Now, when you're pressing these liners in, it's very important that you make sure that this diameter that is going to be pushed in is clean as a whistle because anything that's on there is going to get pushed underneath that flange where it's got to sit yeah. down. Okay. So you can see that diameter and that diameter are the same. So you've just got to push that one through. Just put a little smear of that up the top here and that'll just ensure that it's sealed around the top of the, between the top of the block and the liner. And we use this aluminium sleeve here. So we just push it in about 10 mil or so, and then do what we normally do, mate. We put the, the bars crossed over. Yeah. And that will, what that does is make sure it's pushed in square. It just means that, because obviously the bed is on these screw gears, it's the bed is not necessarily dead parallel to the bottom yeah. of that, the bottom of this ram. So I can feel, just feeling that bar there, you can sort of almost feel the interference. Yeah. The thou and half's nothing. If it was three thou, it's too much really. It doesn't need to be that much. And that is, that is it, mate. I do. So you can see that now, it's pushed down. It's going quite well, really, doesn't it? We've probably got about five thou of liner proud of the block face, but we can face that, give it all a nice little 
fresh face and that's job done, isn't it? Yeah. Nice little conversion. I do. Perfect. Well, here we are again, guys. Why are we in the office, you may ask? What little warranty issue have we got going on? Which customer has annoyed me today? Well, no one actually, guys. The reason I'm in here is just to give you a little bit of information on some emails, comments in previous videos um, about um, a specific subject, and that is cost. Cost of these engines, how much do they cost? Um, and also, why do we not get involved in too many normal engines, as in, I'm assuming they mean everyday engines, the repair engines from the garages. Um, so they sort of tie in together really, and the reason is, guys, is cost and morals, really. And what I mean by that is, if you notice, a lot of the engines that we do are either the fast road stuff, the competition stuff, the classic stuff, um, people's hobby cars, basically. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because we like to do, as you know by our, um, by our videos, we like to do things thoroughly and properly on every engine. Um, so that is the sizing, the balancing, all the rest of it, because we know how out of shape these engines can be. And the everyday engine in cars, take a modern diesel for instance, they are no different to these competition engines um, as far as clearances go. They're highly strong, especially the diesels, even van engines, they're highly strong engines um, that need to be all in tolerance. You know, they go for a lot of load, high compression on the diesel, you know, turbocharged. People forget how much power these things are producing. And to do them and make them affordable for the customer like that, it's just, it's not gonna happen. You know, they, you find with a car like that, an everyday car, say a van for instance, they want the thing done quick, they want it done as cheap as possible. Being off the road or, or the engine broke is an inconvenience. So they just want it as, you know, as cheap as possible really. Um, and to do these engines as cheap as possible, you do unfortunately have to miss out the processes that we like to do on all our engines. So the sizing and all the rest of it. So when you go to one of these big engine reconditioners or go online and you see these engines that are um, on exchange or outright and they're you know under two grand or whatever, what they're actually doing for that money is they are replacing the necessary part. They're not going through the full Monty. They're not doing a, a bespoke build. They're just replacing the damage bits, getting the things running. Um, and they work on, I suppose, uh, they, they work on the fact that they're gonna have some back. Um, if they try and cut the time and make a bit of a profit out of that, even if they have one back, they can turn it around, do another one. They might get, for every one, they'll probably get half a dozen where they don't get back. That's fine. But that's not what how we want to work. It's a big inconvenience half the time. Um, some of these big companies we know they they will pay out on warranty, but they their hourly rate that they'll pay is nothing like what it actually costs. So it's a big inconvenience to the customer and everyone else involved, you know, and, and it ends up costing the customer more in the in the long run. And we are not willing to do these engines unless we do them properly, you know, and to do them properly is probably going to cost getting on, so, in some cases, twice as much as what some other people are charging to go through them. So best of luck to them. Um, but all we say when people ring up is, look, if we do it, it's going to be X amount, which is probably considerably dearer than what someone else will charge, but we will be doing it properly, you know, but just be aware of things that sound too cheap because, you, you know, they usually are too good to be true. So that's the reason we don't get involved with two. There are some that we get involved with, like I said before, the transits and the sprinters, because we can get decent engine parts for cheap and we know we, we, we know that we can spend the time just checking the bits. You know, even, even if we buy a brand new set of rods, it's way cheaper than just checking and sizing the old ones. So we just do that, you know, and we will do those. But it's still more expensive than some people, but we go that extra mile. Um, but yeah, the moving on to the Cosworths and stuff like that, the four-cylinder stuff, the track stuff, it goes on time really, guys. So parts, depending what parts they use, I mean, the Cosworths range on doing a stock build, what we do, you're looking at about 1,500 quid's worth of parts. 
Then you've got your machining and balancing, etc., which is probably six, seven hundred quid. Then you've got your labour on top, which is your stripping, building, dummy building, um, sizing of the rods, etc., etc. Um, and that we estimate, bear in mind we're £80 an hour now, we normally do on a worst case estimate about 40 hours on a four cylinder. Um, if, it's, if you've got to start porting heads and um, matching manifolds, etc., you can go up to 50, but we'll know that when we strip it. So the way we work is we get an engine in, spend two, three hours stripping it, measuring everything. We know where we are, what we need, and then we send out sort of two estimates one parts one machine and labor and then the customer knows exactly worst case what it is and we'll what we say is if it takes us less time out of that then we just will deduct those off at the end so at least the customer knows what they're getting but generally to do one of these Cosworths now on a stock build providing everything's salvageable inside you don't get much change from five thousand quid guys five or six thousand quid plus the VAT so you know, a lot of the cozies that come in that need cams and bits and bobs like that, you could be running up to eight, 9,000 quid on some of them, especially if you have to start putting a crank in it. So they're all different, but that's the way we tend to work. So we work on a worst case scenario estimate, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, that's the main reason, guys, we don't get too involved with these normal everydayers. It's just not worth it, especially if, um, if the vehicle, it's all right buying a motor for two grand if the car's worth eight, but it ain't worth spending sort of five, six grand on the motor if it's still worth eight. You may as well, you know, cut your losses, I suppose. So, yeah, hope that helps, guys. If you uh, need any more information, just put it down in the comments below. But um, that's it for another video, guys. Until Friday, thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we'll see you then. Take care, guys.